from God's most holy, most eternal word, the word that is the truth, the truth that will set us free. Mark chapter 4, verses 34 through 41 from the New International Version of the Bible. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. They were also, there were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're going to let Jesus teach us something about our faith today. And my hope is that uh, his word will find its target in each of us, and maybe our faith will even grow from that. I appreciate the picture of the boat in the storm. It's not a giant boat, but it sure seems like a giant storm. And in reading these scriptures today, I tried to be in the boat with Jesus and his disciples. Now that takes a little imagination for me, but not a whole lot. I have been in boats and ships, but I've never had the experience of being scared to death in one. Perhaps some of you have. I was once in a large passenger boat uh, crossing Lake Superior to go to a place called Isle Royal. How many of you have heard of Isle Royal? All right. And uh, what was happening was that Christine and I were taking a group of junior high kids uh, to that island for a week of backpacking in that uh, remote area, which that was a little scary. But as for being on the boat going over, I was never afraid, not afraid to death. However, on the boat to Isle Royal, the motion of the boat was a slight side-to-side -side motion. And don't imagine that too much. Some of you will get in trouble. <laughs> I got terribly sick. But at no time on that boat was I scared to death. In fact, I wasn't afraid of death at all. I was so sick I wanted to die. <laughs> so... And that was my worst boating experience uh, to date. But as far as being in the boat with the disciples, it is somewhat easy for me to imagine the fear. And uh, those with the failure of imagination could simply remember the event in Missouri. As the news placed us, in a way, on that duck boat when a particularly bad storm was coming, and in that the boat was swamped and so many died. We can almost experience the fear and certainly we experience the tragic sense of loss of life. So here in this scripture, I'm in the boat with the disciples. With the disciples. I feel their fear, and even with my Lord in the boat, I can still imagine their fear and feel my own. But Jesus' word to them will not focus on their fear. The word Jesus will speak 
to them is a word to their faith. He says, why are you so afraid? It's not that one measure of fear is totally unacceptable, but why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? You see, the truth is we will all experience fear. It goes with being in this body that we are living. It's one of our mechanisms for alarm. And what we recognize as a threat to our life or what is dear to us in our life, whether that's a job or another person or our reputation or whatever, we will have some fear going on in the midst of that uh, threat. I tell you, I, like many, most of us, I can get afraid. The intensity of that fear varies. And I can get to a place where I can even live in fear. And the question isn't, what's wrong with my fear? The question is, what role does my faith play in my fear? Is my faith of that type that gives me great confidence in God? A confidence in God that some settles in right in the midst of my fears, calming me, strengthening me, and keeping me in Him. In His love, in His purpose for my life, in His hope, in His joy. Even in the midst of times when I am afraid. Perhaps that's a question or a thought for many of us. And I would say that I have that faith some, and I could have more. A question of our faith, exposed even in the midst uh, of our fears. And when I look at this scripture, that is what I am trying to learn about. I think the question for the disciples is they didn't really know who Jesus was. What they saw on that boat wasn't the real Jesus. And that is a matter of our faith. Their shortcomings of faith in the midst of fear are where our shortcomings and where my shortcomings in faith in the midst of fear can be. A failure to truly have confidence in the Jesus that I know. And so it's exposed in terms of not really seeing the real Jesus. When their fear rises in the boat, they see Jesus sleeping on the back cushion. And one of the things they have questions about is whether Jesus cares. Whether Jesus cares. Do you not care that we perish? Do they know the real Jesus? And they're questioning about whether Jesus cares. You know, that question can happen particularly in our own lives in the, some matter of fear in which we are facing. Sometimes we can start to think, now Jesus, are you asleep on the switch here? Don't you realize what I am going through? Do you really care about me? Or is there so many people in the world that have greater problems that you don't really care about what my fear is and what I am facing? These are little ways in which we begin to question even our Lord, whom we are bonded to in a covenant of faith, question our Lord's caring for us. And the other place where the disciples have a weakness is in not knowing the power that their Lord Jesus has. They have seen him do things that other human beings cannot do. And they know it has to do with him being a man of God. They see him heal people, cast out demons. They've seen that in Mark already, and they've seen quite a bit of it. But when it gets down to this storm that they are in, they're not sure what Jesus can do. They think perhaps he has something in his bag of tricks can, that can deal with this. That's why they try to wake up Jesus in the first place. 
Now, for me, I think that some of those people were fishermen. They're used to being on boats. And if you just think about it in a human way, it's more important to have a good seaman on your trip, on your boat, than a landlubber like Jesus. But somehow, Lord, we've seen you do things. Do you have, I, I don't think you have, but do you have something you can do here in the midst of what we are fearing, our own death? And Jesus will soon tell them by his actions of calming the storm, he has the power of God. And eventually they'll put that together. That this one who they are in a covenant of faith with is God. A God who has the power. And this God who has revealed to us in scripture and by what God has done that he has the love and the care for each one of us. You see, the word faith itself comes in the context of the Old Testament scripture and carried through but broadened and enriched in the New Testament really has its base in treaty language, in covenant language. In the Old Testament, the word that was, we get pistos from, which is the Greek word faith, is a matter of confidence and trust enough confidence and trust in him whom you have entered a covenant with that you think that that person will do what they should do by covenant and what they said they would do and what I will therefore be able to do in my portion of the covenant. To get at where our faith may be need to be strengthened in times of fear. Think of faith as that matter of plain confidence and trust in the one whom you have put your life into his hands, the one you belong to. That's your covenant of God. You entered into it from baptism. You rehearse that covenant of God when you take communion. Do you have confidence and trust in whom you are in a covenant of faith relationship with? And that is this one. This one who the disciples discover is sleeping on their boat. And they're wondering if he cares. And this one who does not know if this one that they are in covenant with and walking around and following Galilee has the, pro has the power to even confront death itself and any catastrophe that is around us. When I think about them questioning Jesus' caring and Jesus' power, they will come out of this episode with a tremendous sense of his power. But you know what? I sometimes think the caring part still lingers. What they'll come to realize is this one with so much power who they are wondering if they're going to, this one will save them from the storm. He's one with that kind of power is not even going to try to save himself. And that's because his love in some way overcomes his power that he would have to call a legion of angels when he's on the cross so that he would not have to die. Our Lord's love and our Lord's power always go together. The way sometimes we think that the Lord ought to exercise his power, we don't always in that moment agree with. But the power is there. And you and I need to trust that that power is there because of our, and it will be employed in our Lord's love for us no matter what we're going through in this body. And then when the fact comes that we all have to die, his power and his love will be there in what comes after in the life that will last eternally with him. Know whom Jesus, whom Jesus is that you are in covenant relationship with. Let's go now to this table 
where once again we see the covenant displayed and by participation in this covenant we become a part of it when we receive the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Our prayer of confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, come to us today. Come in the midst of the fears or things that we're dread or what we are anxious about or maybe even our constant state of fear that uh, we can live in in the midst of a troubled world. And Lord, settle down deep in us. Let us receive, Lord, from our, our covenant with you and our confidence and trust in you, Lord Jesus. Let us receive your calm. Let us receive your strength. Let us receive the power of your hope. You will not fail us, Lord Jesus and your love is complete, and your power is immeasurable. No matter what happens in this body, you will not fail us. And so, Lord, we see and ask that this bread be the reality of your presence for us, you who came into this world and broke in, in your body by us. It is here in this bread. And your presence, Lord, in this cup that offered, offered a covenant of faith, of love, a covenant of blood to us. We pray this as we pray in Jesus' name, the, ter the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for thee. Take and eat as oft as you will in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink it in remembrance of me. I would ask if those who would assist in our receiving communion, if you will come forward. As they're coming forward, we will have three communion stations across the front, one on the left side of your left of that section of pews that you're sitting in. And uh, uh, we will ask that you would come to that communion station. When you're there, hold out your hand. I'll put a piece of bread in your hand. You take that bread and dip it in the cup. This is not a United Methodist table. It's a table of our Lord. Our Lord is the host, and our Lord invites you. Our Lord invites you to come and be a part of this binding covenant of love with him, receiving his forgiveness, receiving all of his uh, care and his power now that you are letting into your life through his Holy Spirit. And so you are invited by him to participate.